Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri Wahlul uqdatan min lissani yafqahu qawli wa ba'd Faqad qala Allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala fil Qur'an al-Majid A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin Sarakallahu al-azim In the 50th year of Nabuwat Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the life of the messenger of Allah it is called Amul Huzn the year of grief in the 50th year the one who supported the messenger of Allah financially the one who supported the messenger of Allah compassionately the one who supported the messenger of Allah emotionally passed away. Kharija radiallahu ta'ala and her, the wife of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dies at the age of 65. Whilst the messenger of Allah is 50 years old, the one who stood by his side, the one Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and she said something, about Khadija, not bad. She was just speaking and she mentioned something about Khadija. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Oh Aisha, don't speak like that about Khadija. Don't speak like that about Khadija. She supported me at a time when the entire world turned their back on me. He said, when no one will believe in me, she supported me. She believed in me. She dies in the 50th year of Nabuwat. And people will throw rubbish at the Messenger of Allah and he comes home. She would be there to console him. His physical consoler. Consoling the Messenger of Allah in this emotional state. I mean, people are not throwing garbage at us. When we do our dawah, yes, people may say something that affects us. But no one is throwing rocks at us. No one has anything to say about us or against us or anything like that or to cause us physical harm. So we don't know what's it like. You go to do dawah by someone's home and they walk out with a garbage bin of garbage and they just walk straight up to you and throw it on you. How would you feel? How would you react? You might take a big garbage and stone them back down and I come to give you the good word and you've been pelting me with garbage. Take this, take that, take the next. She was the one who would console the messenger of Allah. From the moment he received the first revelation, Khadija was there. He comes down from Ghari Hira, shaking, trembling, sweating. And the place was already cool. And the place was cool and he was sweating. Usually you when the place is cool, you don't sweat. But the messenger follows cold sweating. And a person cold sweats when he's, he's frightened. Out of fear, he cold sweats. And he says, something has overtaken me. Something held me. Oh Khadija, I fear that something is going wrong to me. Did she say, well, it's good for you because I tell you to go in that cave, that dark cave. You're only going to stay, spend long hours there. I don't know what I'm telling you. Why don't you stay home? Did she say that? And usually between a husband and wife, they have this girl, you know, I'm playing football there and I get kicked. It's good for you. And I tell you to go and play football. Old man like you want to run ball. She says, Allah will never cause anything to harm you. She said, oh, oh, messenger of Allah, look. Look at you. Look at your personality. Look at your character. 
You care about the needy. You look after the orphans, the old, the poor, the weak, the downtrodden. You are there for, you, for them. Allah will never cause any harm to come to you. The one who stood by his side through thick and thin dies. A few months later on, the one who supported the Messenger of Allah with physical protection, who loved him as his own son, cared for him, and so long as he was alive, Christ dare not touch a hair on the body of the Messenger of Allah. Very soft, very lenient, passes away. The uncle of the Messenger of Allah, Abu Talib. Once the Prophet وسلم, comes home, he used to live by Abu Talib. Abu Talib adopted him. And he came home and he saw his uncle weeping, crying. And he asked his uncle, Oh, my uncle, did Christ come to you? He said, Yes. He said, What did they say to you? He said, They want you to give up that message. So, oh, my nephew, they want, they want you to give up that message. You know what he said? There are two narrations. Mostly we know one of these narrations. And one of those narrations is if you were to put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I still would not give up this message. There is another narration. The other narration, he says to his uncle, he said, oh my uncle, you see the sun? He said, yes. He said, oh my uncle, if you were to reach to that sun and catch a flame for me and bring back that flame for me, I still wouldn't give up that message. He said, if you were to reach that sun, and catch a flame for me and brings it back. I mean, that's the height of impossibility. We are millions of miles away from the sun. And on a 36 degrees day, we are sweltering in the sun. Nobody wants to come out. Everyone's wearing Ray-Ban shades or bootleg shades covered up in their rooms in the AC. AC cars or vans don't want to go out in the sun. It's too hot. You will get a tan. You don't want that. And he is telling his uncle that if you catch a flame from that sun for me and you bring it back for me, I still wouldn't give up this message. The one who physically protected the message of Allah he dies. So the one who consoled him, and when he, was, when he would go through his emotional state, she dies a few months after. The one who gave the messenger of Allah physical protection dies. Economically, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala supported the messenger of Allah with everything she had. Their brothers and sisters, when we speak, Khadija, when we speak about a wife who stood by her husband, supporting him in the true sense, Kharija radiallahu ta'ala fit that description perfectly. Not once Kharija radiallahu ta'ala ever complained about the messenger of Allah. Oh, you're not working. You're not bringing in food in the house. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. She supported the messenger of Allah with everything she had. Every step she supported the messenger of Allah. In the early days of Islam, she was there. She was his only supporter. In the very early days of Islam, the first woman to accept Islam was Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Can you imagine the emotional state the Messenger of Allah was in? So long as he was married to Khadija, he never took a second wife. When his uncle died, it just added to his emotions. 
What was worse than that? The Messenger of Allah in Mecca. Now the Quraysh, they saw a way to the Messenger of Allah to cause him harm. And the persecution, it increased. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he thought that the work slowed down in Mecca. And that affected the Messenger of Allah terribly. So he thought to himself, well, probably if I go to the neighboring locality and invite them, probably they will lend me an air. Where did he go? He went to Taif. And everyone knows about Taif. Everyone knows the story of Taif. He goes into Taif. He goes and pay attention to who he goes to. He goes to Banu Thaqif. And he speaks to the leaders of Banu Thaqif. And he said to them, listen, you know the meeting is private between us. You know, if you choose to accept, then that's best for you. And if you do not accept the message, then let's keep it between ourselves. You know, let's not tell, you know, every Tom, Dick, Harry, and Jackson a wrong tongue. And this is the adab of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he goes into a community, he wouldn't just go to everybody and leave out the leader for last. He goes to the authority first. Seek permission first. So he invites them to Islam, but things didn't turn out so good. One of them said, he said, you know, if you are a messenger, and he was speaking very harsh, then I cannot see myself speaking to a messenger of Allah like this, how I'm speaking to you. So, you do, I mean, I don't think you're a messenger. Because if you're a messenger, I wouldn't be speaking to you like this. And people, a man said to the messenger of Allah, one of the leaders, he said, why didn't Allah choose someone better than you? Couldn't Allah find someone better than you to choose as a messenger? You mean out of all the people in the land of the Arabs, Allah had to choose you? See, in that society, what defines status was your strength. Physical strength, economical strength, and your status. This is how a big man was viewed in society. Because of your money, you were looked at as a big man. Because of your status, you have good family lineage. You were looked at as a big man. You were a leader. You were looked at as a big man. And a strong man, a warrior, were looked at as a big man. Umar ibn Khattab was a big man. Umar didn't come from a huge tribe. Umar wasn't a wealthy man. But Umar was a very strong and powerful individual. Very strong and powerful individual. So he was respected because of his strength. In that harsh environment, if you did not fit into one of these three groups, then you was a nobody. And things hasn't changed much since then to now. It's still the same. You know, Sahabi, whilst describing the true servants of Allah, you know how he defined a true servant of Allah? He said the true servants of Allah are those people who are unpopular. They are not popular. He said when they are in the houses of Allah, no one knows them. When they are not there, they are not missed. If they fall ill, nobody visits them. They are people who are not known. He said these people, these are the true servants of Allah. They are famous in the eyes of Allah, but in the eyes of men, people don't know them. People don't know them. You come to the masjid and you see a man in the corner there, and you don't think much about him. See a poor little guy in the corner there, you don't pay much attention to him. 
You look at this person there, you don't pay much attention to him. Whether he comes to Masso, you don't come to Masso. Now, nah, fuck about Tina. But, you know, like that. So, in our society, we look at these three groups to define who is big man in society. And that is the way it was back then also. So, the Messenger of Allah, he left. And whilst he was leaving Taif, these leaders, they unleash the angry mob upon him. You know, the riffraff in the society. They went and they mustered up the angry mob. And they started off by pelting a few rocks. And then if you see somebody throwing a rock at somebody, and, it, and it, you know what I mean, it's good, it's okay by the leaders. Oh, you're going to be throwing or you're going to be pelting. From throwing, it, well, it went to pelting. And Zayd ibn Haritha, the freed slave of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was with him, he said, rocks started to rain on us from every direction. And I will run to the right to try to protect the Messenger of Allah from these rocks. And then when I feel a rock would hit him to his left, I will run in that direction. I will run in front of him. But the, so much was raining upon us. And when that wasn't enough, they were running away. I mean, you're not going to stand up and take a rock to head? I'm sure some of us there probably, somebody hit us with a, you know, a stone or something like that. You're green mango and, oops, a stone hit you. Or you're, pelt, you're playing Pelton. You know, long time had a game called Pelton. I don't know if I you don't play that game. You get a bus head with a stone, you hush him out and you go home quiet and take your bus head. Pelton, Pelton was a famous game long time. Take La Ginette and you pelt with La Ginette. And then you move on to slinging shot. So you know how a rock tastes. They started to aim at their feet. So these men, they wasn't pelting the messenger of Allah to just hurt him enough. They were actually pelting the messenger of Allah to kill him. Their evil intent was to kill the messenger of Allah. The intent of the mushrikeen al-Arab wasn't to just cause hurt to the messenger of Allah. Their intent was to kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa When Uqba bin Abi Mu'it, he attacked the messenger of Allah by al kaaba the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, this man... He stepped on my neck so hard, I thought I was going to die. He said, I thought I was going to die. And the Messenger of Allah and Zayd ibn Haritha, they were running out of Taif. And his sandal, blood started to coagulate in his sandal. And his feet were bleeding. I mean, can you imagine the scene? I mean, their brothers and sisters just... Just picture the scene. And you are running for your life. And in every direction, the people are throwing rocks at you. Not with the intent to miss you. But with the intention that my rock will strike you down. With the intention that I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you until you die. Their intention wasn't to just harm the messenger of Allah. In one year, within a space of a few months, one after the other, the messenger of Allah was struck with emotional grief. And now he has been struck with physical harm. Dear brothers and sisters, you put yourself in a position like that. Sometimes a person goes through something much smaller than that. What happens to them? They burst in a fit of rage. They become angry. They take some action. Wasn't the messenger of Allah going through some emotional state? Wasn't he, shouldn't he have gone through an angry state? Don't you think that that would have made him angry? 
What angers a man? There are numerous things that angers people. One, grief and sorrow. You lost a loved one. Your mother passes away. Your father passes away. Or your wife, or your son, or your daughter dies. You go in this emotional state, and there is this burning rage of anger inside of you that you wish you could do something, but it's out of your control. You can't do anything. And you are just angry. In that state, people punch the wall. They make a hole in the wall. They throw something on the ground. It breaks to pieces. And that emotional state, that state of grief and sadness, you may hit someone. You may say something against someone. In that fit of rage, your mind is clouded. Everyone goes through that. Anger is an irrational, unwanted state of emotion that a person goes through. In every individual, there is the quality of anger. A person might say, well, I don't get angry. Me? No, 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 not me. I don't get angry at all. And I don't get jealous. Yeah, the right moment to come along as yet, don't worry. When it comes along, we will see you. I don't get vexed. Oh, yeah? The right moment to come along yet. I don't get angry. Wait just now. Be some patience. It come in. These are qualities of the heart. <laughs> you cannot say, I don't become angry. You cannot say, I, am not, I don't become jealous. If you're married and you really love your wife and your wife just do so, what's up? What's up? I see her. I see her. I was just turning my head so. You feel like you see her? I'm watching you closely. You know? Don't worry. Women are just like that also. If you're what so, I see her. You know? I see you watching she. But I had to watch the road. How you want me to drive? People do have jealousy in their heart. People do have hatred in their heart. People do have envy in their heart. People do have hatred in their heart. They are brothers and sisters. Every quality that is in the heart, the messenger of Allah taught us how to deal with it. If not by words, by deeds. Now look at all these problems that occurred in this year. If all of these problems happen to you in one a few months, how will that, I mean, what state would you be in? Your wife dies. Your father dies. Your mother dies. People abuse you physically with the intent of killing you. People don't want you around. You come into the masjid and people are speaking about you. People have something to say about you. You're praying salah and you hear people shh, 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 shh. And it's you they're talking about. How does that make you feel? The people used to speak about the messenger of Allah. Not in a good way. I mean, he's walking down the road calmly and this woman will sweep the rubbish from her house and just sit by the window and wait. And when he's passing, she will just throw it on his head. That nice, huh? That nice? If you had a neighbor who always put a nail under your car tire, how would it make you feel? Not that I'm saying that your neighbor will do it. But I'm just saying, if you lived in a community that every time you put on a tire, next morning you get up and you see a car jack up and the tire gone. Angers you, isn't that so? Someone is throwing rubbish on his head. The wife of Abu Talib 
you see, uh, or her slaves go into the desert and pick this thorny plant, and they will camouflage it on the ground. Wherever the messenger of Allah will, will walk, they will throw it on the ground. I remember back then, TN Tech was not wrong. They didn't have street lights. How we will see on a dark night? They didn't have flashlight. Jerusalem was around. Dorsey was around. They didn't have floodlights. No electricity. Probably had a flambeau or a lamp. And he's walking through this pathway and he mashes this thorny plant. So what do you think is going to happen? And he had to put up with that from one to the next, from one to the next. And it's as though this year was a climax of everything. It just happened. His wife died and his uncle died and he got Stone out of Ta'if. Meanwhile, how would you react? What would you do? It infuriates you. You become angry. You want to take some legal action. You want to do something. The messenger of Allah, he goes and he sits beneath a tree. And Jibreel, alayhi salam, he comes to console the messenger of Allah and he says, O oh, messenger of Allah, this angel, he is in charge of al Akshabain, the mountains overlooking Ta'if. And the angel, he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, if you wish, I can cause these mountains to fall on the head of these people. I mean, today these people would have been dust. Nothing. Just a remembrance. See what happened to the people of Taif who stoned the messenger of Allah? Allah caused two mountains to rain down upon them. I mean, imagine the scene. People are looking up and they see a mountain ready to fall on your head. I mean, in that state, that emotional state, in that angry state, what would you have done? Ask yourself a question. In that state, when you are at the height of your anger, how do you react? Do you react with patience, calmness, felicity? Are you calm? Are you smiling? Are you happy? Would you think about not taking action? How would you react? What would you do? You burst in a rage. It's fit of rage and anger. And do you know that the first thing comes to your mind is to cause harm? When you become angry, your mind becomes so clouded that the only thing that you want to do is to hit. And in that rage, you don't know how hard you're going to hit. In that fit of anger, that rage, you don't know what you will do. Your mind is clouded. So did the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yeah, deal with these people for me. They've been raining stones on me, rain back to mountains on them. Did he say that? You ever wonder why the messenger Allah calls the messenger of Allah? In Quran he says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Do you think he's called رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ because he loved the orphans? Do you think he's called رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ because he looks after the needy and he cared about people? He cared about people's feelings that he will feed the hungry? He will clothe the naked. Whatever he had, he would give it away in sadaqah. Do you think he was called Rahmatullah Al-Alameen? Because every time we talk about that, we say, yeah, 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 you know, Messenger of Allah was real kind. And he was really compassionate. And he was real this. And he was, yeah. But when do you exercise the most mercy? When should you exercise the most amount of mercy? 
when you're normal, going about your normal business, and it's easy to dip your hand in your pocket and take out something and give someone, or when you're hard pressed. Because when you're hard pressed, the only person you're thinking about is yourself. When things ain't going so well, the only person you're going to think about is yourself. Yourself comes first. The Prophet says the best salakat to give is when you are hard pressed. That is the time you see the selflessness in a person. He doesn't think about himself, but his concern is about everyone else. When do you think you exercise the most amount, the most amount of mercy? When you have the power to take revenge. When you have that power, I mean, everything is at your fingertips with the press of one button, with the pointing of one finger. Yeah, take him out. Deal with him. Finish him off for me. He can't be hitting me with a rock and getting away with that. We live in a world where taking revenge has become easy. Someone does something to you, the first thing that comes to your mind is take revenge. He can't do me that and get away with it. What makes him think that he can do me something and get away with it? We live in a world where taking revenge has become very easy. It's the norm of the day. <laughs> Regardless if it's, if it's your siblings. And if it's your siblings, they feel the full brunt of your revenge. They feel it. Your neighbor. It's anyone who does something to you. The first thing that comes to mind is to take revenge. But is that the way? Their brothers and sisters, it was very easy for the messenger of Allah to say, yeah, go ahead. Show these mountains on these people. Destroy these people. I mean, all that emotion, all that anger bubbled up into one shell and it just explodes. Everything, one after the other. You know when you say, you know the saying, when it rained, it pours? When it rained, it was pouring. I mean, what more could happen? Consecutively, one after the other. If a person goes through that, he gives up. He gives up. Why do you think people commit suicide? Because they don't know how to deal with their emotions. They don't know how to deal with the stress. They don't know how to deal with an issue. Their backs up against the wall. The easiest way is for me to end my life. They have no way out. So they think that, you know what? I'm going to take my life. And I'm going to drink some. Petroil? No, it ain't gonna kill you. Yeah, I say going and kill you. Petroil is kill? Petroil will kill you. Pepsi? I might drink grandma's own mixing Pepsi. Ends his life. What did the Messenger of Allah he say to the Malaika? He says, No. If they do then become Muslim, then probably from them, someone will become Muslim. In the future, they may become Muslim. Look at what the messenger fellow was thinking about. He wasn't thinking about the rock that struck him on his back, or the one that struck him on his head, and who threw it. He wasn't thinking about the stone, the rocks that was raining down upon him. He wasn't thinking about this horrible man who said, couldn't Allah find somebody better to send but you? I mean, out of everybody in Mecca, Allah had to choose you. You know why they were saying that? You know why they used to say that? Couldn't Allah find, and the Quray Munafiqun al Quraysh of Makkah used to say the same thing. Couldn't Allah find anyone else to send but you? Being an orphan in that environment wasn't the easiest thing. And the Messenger of Allah was an orphan. They will class you as a nobody. You don't have any father, no mother. The Messenger of Allah didn't have any brothers and sisters. 
the side with him. He had no one. And they would look at him as a nobody. He didn't have wealth. He didn't have status. He didn't live in a mansion. He didn't have any land. Al-Walid had land stretching from Mecca all the way to Ta'if. He didn't have these things. So a man like that, living in the harshness of that environment, he was considered a nobody. And for a man who is like that, to come now and say, Allah has bestowed nabuwat upon me, I have been sent as a messenger to you. You believe that Allah is one, and you will become successful. And this was the message. Who are you to come and tell us that? You are nobody. Having to deal with all of these things. I mean, don't you think that the messenger follower would remember these things? <coughs> He's human, isn't that so? He had emotions. He will weep. He became saddened. He suffered loss. He will go through everything like a human being. He felt the heat of the sun. Everything he would go through. But what was his response? He said, no. These people do not become Muslim. Then probably their relatives in the future may accept Islam. After the battle of Hunayn, Ta'if became Muslim. After the battle of Hunayn, Ta'if became Muslim. Islam entered into Ta'if. See, we do not know what lies around the bend. We don't know what's on the other side of the bridge. We do not know what's the outcome of our actions. If we take harsh action or a means, we, a means to take revenge, we have that at our fingertips. And we use that as a tool to cause harm. You do not know in the future what the outcome of it will be. How was Sindh in India? How did Islam enter into Sindh? The Sindh province. You know how Islam entered there? Decades after, Muhammad bin Qasim al thaqafi 17 years old, the nephew of Hajjaj bin Yusuf al thaqafi quite a famous character. The tyrant, Hajjaj bin Yusuf. Muhammad bin Qasim al thaqafi was his nephew. You know where they were from? Ta'if. Muhammad bin Qasim was placed in charge of a naval fleet at the age of 17 goes and conquers Sindh, the Sindh province. And under his reign, which lasted just for a few years, Islam spread throughout Sindh. If the messenger of Allah had said to the angel, go ahead, throw the mountain on their heads. Go ahead, destroy them, annihilate them. Wipe them off the face of the earth. They don't deserve living. When the man stood up in front of the messenger of Allah and he disrespected the messenger of Allah by saying, Oh Muhammad, you are being unfair and you are only thinking about your relatives and giving them the booty. Ali radiallahu ta'ala stood up with an unsheathed sword and said, O Messenger of Allah, this man deserves to die. Why? You cannot speak to the Messenger of Allah like that. This is why many scholars have said, if you even speak about the button of the Messenger of Allah as being, oh, it looks so, you know, brown and it's stained and all, they said that deserves, the punishment for that is death. 
very strict. See, we do not know the status of the Messenger of Allah. The only time you will realize the status of the Messenger of Allah is on the day of Qiyamah. That is when you will realize that. When he is the one who is interceding for you and I, then you will know what his status is. Now we live in, yeah, yeah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talking about him, like, you know, we pitch marbles and play tree hole. And he's our buddy, and you know, we, we used to hang out in the pizza shop, eating pizza and drinking Coca-Cola. <coughs> and people today will give lip service, talk about the love, their undying love for the Messenger of Allah. Oh yeah, you know, we love the Messenger of Allah. Yeah, we love him so much, man. I can't even begin to tell you how much I love him, but all I know, I love him. And they are swaying and singing and Salah is going and the time is just passing and they're just singing away and swaying and brother, it's time for Salah. A few moments more, a few moments more. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said Salah is best on its time. But that can wait. That can wait. And oh yeah, 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 we love the Rasul, yeah, I will dig for him. But when you hear about his teachings, I ain't ready for that yet. When you hear about his teachings, that in Quran, that is how the trend goes. When people hear about the ways and the practices of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, two things you hear coming out of their mouths. One, me ain't ready for that yet. Okay? You're young, you're ready for that yet. But when you advance in age, you're ready now. Now my brother, my head so hard. My head too hard for them kind of thing. All these young fellas, let go ahead now. So when will you be ready? And then the other thing is that, because you're not following the path of the Messenger of Allah, that's what you're telling me to do. That in Quran. That is clear ignorance. That is ignorance to the highest level. We will only realize his status, what the messenger of Allah, who he is, on the day of Qiyamah. When we are looking forward for his shafa'ah, when all heads are turned in that direction, hoping, wanting his intercession, then you will know what's his status. Then you will know why Ali radiallahu ta'ala wanted to take the head of Dhul Khwaisara when he disrespected the Messenger of Allah. And listen how the man addressed the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad, you are only thinking about your relatives. Subhanallah. Allah does not address the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as Muhammad in Quran. Allah does not address the Prophet ﷺ as Muhammad in Quran. Imagine that. Does Allah say, Oh Muhammad, do this, do that, do the next. Oh Muhammad, I notice you haven't been doing this. Ya ayyuhal nabi, ya seen, ya ayyuhal muddathir, ya ayyuhal muzzammil. Allah addresses him by a sifat, a quality. And that is how someone beloved is addressed. How you call your wife? Mary, come here. They say, babes, come now, girl. Let me go down in the supermarket now. Chug along, you know. Uh, I don't know what people is called, but <laughs> probably that. You call her by a pet name. It's not so. You call she by she name. She say, what to you, boy? Don't call me that. Call me babes. Hope I put some of these brothers in trouble. You call her by a sifat, a quality, befitting her. When Allah addresses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran to show you his status, Allah addresses him with a quality. Allah addresses him by a quality. And this man, he stands up and he says, Oh Muhammad, Ali radiallahu ta'ala, I mean, he couldn't sit down and take that. He said, oh, messenger of Allah, 
This man deserves to die. He has disrespected you. And now, all the people of Taif, Banu Thaqif, they didn't only disrespect the Messenger of Allah, they harmed him physically. And the Messenger of Allah, did he take revenge? Did he take revenge? What did he do? He said, if these people don't become Muslim, he saw what was around the corner. He was looking on the other side of the bridge. He wasn't looking at the next step in front of him. He wasn't looking for a quick fix. A quickie. Fast way out of the scene. Let me just deal with them, annihilate them, and we could build roads and bridges over them. We could fill up the land. That valley always needed filling. Show the mountain on them. We could build a mall here. He was looking around the bend because he saw a light around the bend. He saw what was on the other side. If these people do not become Muslim, probably Allah will give their hearts guidance in the future. Allah took a man out of there, carried him to send in India, and he propagated the religion of Allah. Muhammad bin Qasim al Thaqafi was from the tribe of Thaqif, the tribe in Taif. This is the same tribe that the Messenger of Allah went to. The leaders of the same tribe, Banu Thaqif, were the ones who were verbally abusing the Messenger of Allah. The men and the women and the children, the riffraffs, were from Banu Thaqif. These were the ones who were raining rocks on him. And Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu ta'ala. Don't you think they deserve a punishment? Don't you think that they deserve something? Their brothers and sisters, through the life of the Messenger of Allah, you will see this. You will see how the Messenger of Allah would subdue his anger. Because he knew the consequences of it. See, the consequences of anger, firstly, when a man's mind, oh, sisters don't think you're getting away from this, when a, a woman's mind also, man and woman, that quality is innate in them. When your minds are clouded with anger, Sometimes you say such words that cuts deep. You utter such statements, such bad words, such foulness comes out of your mouth that it's worse than if you were to slap them. And the a man came to the Messenger of Allah and he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, who is the best Muslim? He said, Who is the best Muslim? Ayyul Muslimina khayran, ya Rasulullah. Which Muslim is the best Muslim? The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did he say, Well, the man who pray in a lot of tahajjud, that's the man. The man who you see five days, five times in the masjid daily, he's the man. The man who is well charitable, that's the man. If we were to ask that question in any given community, you will get tons of answers. Because see, everyone has their own definition of who the best Muslim is. Isn't that so? See a brother making a lot of dhikr? That man, that man fit the description you're looking for. A man can read Quran real sweet. And the man leads salah, you feel like you're floating. I mean, you're feeling elevated. Put that man to lead salah again. That Arafala, I just feel like I ain't got nothing when I want to. There's no electricity when he read. Nothing, it's just dry. Quran is supposed to be read from here. It comes from the heart. Dua comes from the heart. Quran comes from the heart. Muslims don't get lip service. We don't do that. We are sincere in Quran, we are sincere in Dua, we are sincere in Salah. 
The only time he has feel that kind of emotion is when he's standing behind one of the imams in Haramain Sharifain. Isn't that so? He does actually feel like the verses are being revealed. You feel like it now come down. You feel like it's the first time you hear Falak and Nas, and you feel like it's the first time you hear it. We can define the best Muslim with all sorts of nice, good stuff. Did the Messenger of Allah define a good Muslim, the best Muslim like that? He says, Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi. He says that the best Muslim, the best Muslim, is that person from whose tongue and hands other Muslims are safe. When nasu ajma'in in another riwayah, and everybody safe. What did he say? Your tongue, your hands. And the commentators of hadith. They say that the, probably the reason why the Messenger of Allah used his tongue before hands is because the wounds which are caused by the tongue, there is no cure for it. There are no cure for it. Today you tell someone something. You speak an ill word, a harm, harmful word to someone. And their brothers and sisters, to you it's nothing. But to them, they remember you for the rest of their lives. They will remember you for eternity. In a fit of anger, in this rage, a person uttered such words that cuts very deep. There is no cure for that wound. No matter how much you try to make up for what you say, there are no words that can comfort there are no words to comfort that person. There are no words. Words you never meant to say. Things that you don't want to say. Things that you never meant to say. But you know why they say? When you're angry, then what is really in your heart comes out. How you truly feel to someone that is when it comes out. See, you could put on a good show, but how long are you going to put on that show for? Yes, mashallah, brothers, mashallah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I dig Muslim brothers. You know, yeah. And from the moment you become angry, all oh, I dig Muslim brother, and yeah, brother, mashallah, and alhamdulillah, all oh, I've gone through the back door, and you just start lacing abuse. What you really had in the heart, at a time of anger, comes out. And then, you think that your anger is not in you. You don't have that quality in your heart. Allah has a funny way of bringing it out. And Allah shows you that don't continue to fool yourself. That's a quality in you. Don't tell people, well, I, brother, I don't become angry. You know, you know I, I real cool. No, you have anger in you. A man came to the Prophet Abu Hurairah and he narrated this incident. He said, a man came to the Prophet and he said, the he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, advise me. And the Prophet said, I advise you not to become angry. So the man said, Okay. Oh, Messenger of Allah, advise me again. And the Messenger of Allah repeated the same thing. And the man said, Advise me again. And the Messenger of Allah repeated the same thing again. Abu Hurairah and he said, And the man kept on asking the same question. And the Messenger of Allah kept on repeating the same thing. Do not become angry. Do not become angry. Do not become angry. And the man left. Sometime later on, the man, I mean, if a person keeps on repeating that statement, brother, don't become angry. You don't think much about it. Okay, yeah, 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 let me move on. Now. Next advice. <coughs> and he said the same thing again. He said, but you just said the same thing again. You trying to say the same thing twice different. You just said the same thing again. And he said the same thing again. Brother, I'm looking for some good advice. Isn't that good advice? You know what that man said? He said, for long, I thought about what the Messenger of Allah said to me on that day. And I came to realize that anger, anger, it's, it consists of every type of evil. 
He said, anger consists of every type of evil. That is why the messenger of Allah was telling him the same thing over and over and over. Don't become angry. Do not become angry. You should not become angry. Don't become angry. He said it consists of every type of evil. The first consequence of anger is that you verbally abuse. You verbally abuse people in the worst of ways. And as the Arab poet, he says, that the wounds which are caused by a sword, for it, there is some cure. You get a cut. You go and you get some bandage. You bandage it. You put some antibiotic powder on it. You wipe it with some savlon antiseptic to clean it. And a few days time you all healed up. He said, but the wounds which are caused by the tongue, for it there are no cure. There is no cure for that. You can ask forgiveness from now until, and the person might say, yeah, yeah, I forgive. But you know, the old saying, you bury the hatchet, but you remember the spot. We will say, yeah, 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 I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. But you know what? Every time you see that person, guess what's the first thing you're remembering? The first thing you will remember, and the only memory that you have about that person is how he abused you. That's the only memory you will have about him or her. How he or she abused me. You did not exercise patience. The second consequence of anger, you cause physical harm. How many times have you read on the newspapers children being beaten to death? Why do you think the man just take the child or the person just take the child and, and feel to slap them up? No. Something sparked that anger inside of them that they couldn't deal with that and they hit. And that hit turned out to be fatal. Physical harm. The Prophet sallallahu in every moment when he may become angry, and the Sahabas said when the Messenger of Allah became angry, we would know when he would become, ang become angry. It is not that he said something or he did something. You know what happened? His face changed color. And he would sweat by the forehead. He said that is when we know the Messenger of Allah was displeased about something. I mean, imagine. In the Battle of Moraisi, just a few moments ago, you waged war against the Islamic State. You lost the war. I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was only later uh, in the Medinan era that he, after, it was after uh, the Battle of Khandak that he said that today, from today on, we would not allow them to attack us. We will do the attacking. Because it was becoming a little too funny. I mean, you only want to attack us, attack us, leave us alone. Leave us to practice our deen alone. You don't want us in Medina, fine, we move to Medina. You don't want us in Mecca, fine, we move to Medina. You didn't want us to preach Islam in Mecca, so we are here in Medina to preach Islam. What's the problem now? But the problem wasn't their presence. The problem was the message. So they will leave all the way from Mecca, to come all the way in the Medinan territory to wage war. And after the Battle of Moraisi, uh, the leader of the leader of that tribe, his daughter was taken as a captive, a prisoner of war. Her name is Juwairia. And the Messenger of Allah proposed to her, and the Messenger of Allah married. So when the leader of this tribe just a few moments ago was uh, waged war against the Muslims. When he heard that, the man took 100 camels and he decided to go and ransom his daughter. Now I want you to keep in mind what was going on. Eh? 
This is a time of war. In war, there are no friends. Between enemies, there are no friends. A few moments ago, you was trying to kill me. Given the right opportunity, you would have killed me. He comes into Medina. See, when he was, when he was in the side state of emotion, he took up a hundred camels. And he just said, I'm going to ransom my daughter. I, I, I want back my daughter. And when he was sitting on the outskirts of Medina, he started to scrutinize the animal. You know, in a high state of emotion, you do, you do anything, you give anything. So he started to scrutinize the animals. And he saw that there was one that was exceptionally, you know what I mean, looking really, really good. So he hid that one behind a mountain. This man, who a few moments ago, led an army to annihilate the Muslims of Medina, walks into Medina, walks up to the Sahabas, and asks to see the Messenger of Allah. Did they beat up the man? Did they floor the man? Give him a clothesline, a body slam, beat him up with some stick, stone him with some rock, spit on him, throw garbage on him? They directed him to the Messenger of Allah. Oh, how did they, why did they react like that? Because they were trained by who? Who trained them? Whose, whose cl classes they would sit down and learn? That is how they were trained. They said the Messenger of Allah is in the masjid. The man goes in. Then the Messenger of Allah ordered the man to be chained, put him in some shackles, bend his hand, bend back his finger, get information from him. Find out where the remaining army is. Let's annihilate them. He welcomes the man with a smile on his face. Come in. Sit down. How may I help you? Did the Messenger of Allah had reasons to deal with this man? A few moments ago, you waged war against me. You're my enemy. I gave you a chance to be my ally, but you choose to be my enemy and wage war against me. Didn't the Messenger of Allah had the right opportunity to hold this man as a captive? Didn't the Messenger of Allah had the right opportunity to have this man put in shackles, jailed, you're an enemy to the state? And the man said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm here to ransom my daughter. The Prophet said, What did you bring? He said, I brought 99 camels. And the Prophet said, What about the one you hid behind the mountain? What did the man do? The man said, Ashadu annaka Rasulullah. He said, You are truly the messenger of Allah. I swear by Allah, no one knows about this besides myself and Allah. There was no one there. You are truly the messenger of Allah. And he became Muslim. If the messenger of Allah greeted the man with anger, what would have been the outcome? What would have been the outcome? And in every case, dear brothers and sisters, the Messenger of Allah wasn't dealing with his wives. The Messenger of Allah wasn't dealing with his daughters. He was dealing with enemies of the state. The Messenger of Allah for 10 years, uh, now about probably nine and a half years, nine years, he had to put up with the hypocrisy of Abdullah bin Ubay. Well, let me just tell you what this man used to do. This, once there was this uh, conflict between the Muslims and one of the tribe, the Jewish tribes in Medina. And there was an agreement in the initial state when the Messenger of Allah came into Medina. That we will support you and you will support us. You will not support the enemies against us and we will not support any invading force against you. We all living in Medina together. Let's have a truce. And it was the time for this tribe to fulfill their agreement. So whilst the Messenger of Allah was going over to them, Abdullah bin Ubay met the Messenger of Allah along the way. And he said, after the, speaking to the Messenger of Allah, he said to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Prophet of Allah, let me go and speak to them. You know why? Because he was selling information to the Jews. So he had a good rapport with them. 
He said, you sit right here, and I'm going to go speak to them for you. He goes, and you know what he says to the Jewish leaders? He said, and you always wanted to kill Muhammad? Look, he's sitting right behind that wall. Eh? All you have to do is go over the wall and take a rock and throw it on his head, and you will kill him. This is what the messenger of Allah had to put up with in Medina with this man. Mind you, the man claimed to be Muslim. But the messenger of Allah knew he was a hypocrite. The messenger of Allah knew this man was a sellout. When the messenger of Allah would be for the day of Jummah, and the Prophet ﷺ will be sitting there waiting, the man will stand up and he will say, everyone listen up very carefully. This is Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. You better listen very attentively to what he have to say. And Omar radiallahu ta'ala used to say, look at the difference. Omar radiallahu ta'ala would calmly say, oh messenger of Allah, just give me permission to kill this man right now. Because they knew his hypocrisy. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, oh Omar, if I allow you to do that, then what will people think of me? Muhammad is killing his own people. Whilst they were going to the battle of Uhud, when they were close to Uhud, this man looks at the Prophet and he says, Oh Muhammad, I don't think there is going to be any fighting, I'm going back home. Takes one third of the army and goes back home. After the battle of Uhud, when the messenger of Allah and the Muslims returned and they suffered a heavy loss, he looked at the messenger of Allah and he said, well, if I thought there was going to be fighting, I would have stayed and fight too. Then when Jibreel alayhi salam, he came and he told the messenger of Allah, put back on your armory. The enemies are on their way back. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi goes out and he commands the army to put back on their armory. Guess who spoke again? Abdullah bin Ubayi ibn Salul. And he said, oh Muhammad, can't you see we just came back from war? And your order is to go back and fight again? Look at everyone. Everyone is tired. We are hungry. We are down. I mean, we are all more emotionally stressed. And you are telling us to go and fight again? Did he participate in the war? If you had a man like that to deal with in your community, how would you react? And how did the messenger follow reacted to this man? Before this man died, when he was on his deathbed, he sends a message with his son, Abdullah. He, subhanallah, his, he had two kids, Abdullah and Jamila. They were very obedient to the Messenger of Allah. They were very, very good Muslims. Very, very obedient to Allah. Very devoted in Islam. And he sends a message with his son Abdullah, to tell the Messenger of Allah, when I die, I want you to lead my janazah. When the man died, Omar radiallahu ta'ala meets the Messenger of Allah, heading where? To pray the janazah for Abdullah bin Ubay ibn Salul. He could have said, nah, I ain't going to do that again. I fed up this man. In every instant, where you could say that the messenger of Allah had a right to take revenge. Did he take revenge? In every instant where someone would anger the messenger of Allah, did he take revenge? Did he take revenge? So when we say, and we read Quran when Allah says, Wama arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Oh Muhammad, we didn't send you except as a mercy to man. You know what Allah is speaking about? In every way, in every characteristic, in every quality that a human being possesses, he was the perfection of humanity. He was the perfection of humanity. In reality, the Messenger of Allah demonstrated in all walks of life 
how to behave under every situation and circumstance. Because everything that the messenger of Allah go, went through, every believer will go through that in his life. Every believer will go through an emotional state. The messenger of Allah went through that. Every believer will have a moment in his life when something may happen to him that angers him. The messenger of Allah went through that in his life. Do you think you can live one day? You know, you hear people saying, boy, I wish I was living at that time. <laughs> wow. Oh, really? You think you can't even live and survive in these times. Why? Because you feel police always looking at you and they're always spying on you. People just doing what they have to do. If someone breaks in the masjid and steals some things, what you will say? The police are doing the work, can't? So if they pack up outside, eh? probably they're doing the work. They're looking out for some crook that might break in your house. They're, doing just, they're just doing what they are told to do. But we are doing what we are told to do. And if someone angers you during your life, you would become angry. The messenger of Allah taught us how to react to that. A person may go through some economical problems. Did the messenger of Allah go through economical problems? Yes. He taught you how to deal with that. Not when your back's up against a wall, economically stressed, you go on and play, play with all at all. And say, well, under this situation, it's halal. You want to starve and death? Allah, Allah go understand. Allah go understand. And then you pull the, the thicky masail out of your pocket. And if you're starving, you can eat the haram. And if you're starving, you can eat the haram. That is if you're starving and on the verge of death. That is what it means. You're starving, but you are starving. You just have a want to taste the haram. You want to fulfill that desire. That is why you want to taste it. So you starve yourself. But that starving is starving on the verge of death, but you have searched all over for food. Man, it's a dashing going behind your house. It's a food all over the place. Where well, you want to eat the haram and, and make your body impure. Every sad moment in your life, the messenger of Allah went through that. So his life is as an example for us, for the life of every believer. His life is as a, a, an example for us, how you behave under all circumstances. How you react to every situation you are confronted with. See, our minds are so clouded with anger at that time. Their brothers and sisters, we allow our emotions to take control. The Prophet ﷺ will continue us to tell the Sahabas, don't become angry. Do not become angry. He knows the consequences of anger. He knows the reality of anger. He knows the repercussion of it. You are not only hurting those who you lash out against, but the first people that you hurt, the first people that you hurt are those who are the closest people to you, near and dear ones. Some people, in a fit of rage, even give their own parents a tongue lashing. Your own parents, imagine that. The poor father and the poor mother gets a tongue whipping from the same child they spend sleepless night looking after. Give up their life, their freedom to look after you. And now he is a big man. You have a voice. Your voice must be heard. I have my own prerogative in life. You tell me what to do and how to do. Ma, you're cramping my style. And in that angry state, your own parents suffer the consequences of your anger. 
May Allah Rabbul Azza, He give us understanding of what has been said here today. May Allah bring benefit out of this gathering. May Allah bless our coming here. And may Allah also bless our departure and cause us to reach back safely to our respective places. Akul kawli hadha, astaghfirullah ali wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-muslimin. Fastaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allahu Akbar.